Pastor, what's the reason for the season? Jesus' love. Yeah. Jesus' healing. Yeah. Jesus' restoration. Yes. Jesus' redemption. Absolutely. But did you know also a reason for the season is to destroy the works of the devil? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. I want to talk about an unusual title today, an unusual topic. But when I get into the message, you'll find that it's even more unusual than that because I want to talk about some things we don't always talk about at Christmas. Father, in the name of Jesus, anoint me and anoint this congregation in this moment because your word is something we need every day and we can get so seasonal that we sometimes forget to be scriptural. And I pray that we would be filled not only with your spirit, but with your, your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Growing up, I recall spending a lot of vacations, a lot of, um, a lot of holidays, a lot of birthdays with a family in our church called the Myers family. It was Alton and Joyce and their daughter, Bonnie. And uh, they were a very precious family that my dad pastored in Garner, North Carolina, which is where I was born. And mom already had a, a one and a two year old. And so uh, they took me, they had lost a little boy and they took me and uh, just showed me an awful lot of love. And I'm still very close to Bonnie, who is the only one remaining in her family and, and all of her children, of course, and, and husband, and they're just a wonderful family. And, uh, I remember a lot of little snippets, little Kodak moments from those times together. One thing I remember is sitting around the supper table. Don't remember anything about how old I was exactly or what was going on, but I was visiting with the Myers family. And on this occasion, Joyce got some mayonnaise and put it on Alton's tomato slices. And I watched that. And of course, I wanted to be just like Alton, so I had to have me some mayonnaise on my tomato slices. And I liked it. In fact, it was really at that moment, I believe, that I became a mayonnaise fan for life, much to the chagrin of my mustard-loving sister, Kathy. Uh, had a lot, of, a lot of condiment battles in the family. but. Uh, I, I remember getting home later. I don't remember, again, the exact time or situation, but I remember one, one time at supper, we were having tomatoes again, sliced tomatoes. And I remember walking over to the refrigerator. I'm just a kid now, but I walk over and get that container of mayonnaise. And my dad, I can feel his eyes on me, watching me. And I open up the mayonnaise and I put it on my tomato slices. And uh, he just kind of watches me do that. And I remember getting away with it a couple more times before mom said, don't do that anymore. And I said, really? She said, it makes your father sick <laughs> to look at it. I'm like, okay. Now, at that time, it seemed unfair, a travesty of justice. But um, I'm a father now, and in my dad's defense, I'm the one sitting across from my sons as they eat things that make me sick. Um, things that are not conducive to healthy digestion, like uh, Vietnamese soups and raw fish. And Tebow brought home a whole jar of pickled eggs this Christmas. And, and you know, I just, I understand a little bit more of how dad felt, but now in my defense, we grew up eating a lot of tomato sandwiches. And other than salt and pepper, there was only one condiment on that tomato sandwich, and it was, you guessed it, mayonnaise. I thought about that. What's the difference? And I, I, I kind of came to the conclusion that it's all right as long as what you do to those tomato slices is hidden between two pieces of bread, where everybody doesn't have to 
to see it. It kind of reminded me of something that happened to Susie and I a few years ago. We were having supper with a family, uh, another pastor and his wife, friends of ours. I finished the meal and there were still some biscuits left. And I remember asking the waitress, I said, uh, could you bring me some molasses? And she did. And I, I took that jar of molasses, I think it was grandma's molasses, and I poured it on the plate and made a really nice circle. And then I began to sop up the molasses with those biscuits. It was so good. And I remember the pastor's wife just looking at me and with really almost a disgusted look in her face. And I finally just said, is everything okay? And she said, I've heard of people doing that, but I've never actually seen it done. <laughs> Have you ever felt like you were doing something that you needed to be out behind the barn with the smokers and the chewers and the dippers? I felt like the sopper should be back there. And I, all, I, all I could say to her was, it's not dirty. And um, that's kind of how I, I felt at that moment. Now, believe it or not, I said all that for a reason because those table talks have a Christmas connection for me. As a pastor, even this Advent season, I've observed that there are certain scripture passages that are scripturally correct. We love them. They are okay. But there are others that are not so much. Not so much. I found that we prefer to get Christmas cards and hear Christmas carols with verses like Luke 146, my soul doth magnify the Lord from the Magnificat, Mary's song of praise. Or Luke 2 and 7, and she brought forth her first born son and laid him in a manger. That's just something that makes us go, ah. Luke 2, 8, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field. You've got to have the shepherds, and their story is, is part of the wonderful story of Christmas. Luke 2, 14, peace, goodwill toward men. Everybody loves that one, even if you're not a part of the church or a believer in Christ. We quote that, that verse. Luke 2, 19, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. We can just see Mary meditating on the scenes there at the stable. But I think about those verses versus these verses. And when I say these verses, I'm referring to some verse references, some scripture passages that speak of some things that are a little bit out there serpents at Christmas pastor yeah bruises violence yeah infanticide dear God at Christmas the devil no 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 we don't really talk about him at Christmas even a, a dragon this kind of language isn't exactly Christmas card or Christmas carol material. It's really not dining room conversation. It's the kind of Bible words that are okay, but they need to be kind of like that tomato sandwich. They need to be sandwiched between two pieces of fruitcake or two Christmas cookies or maybe the front and back cover of a theology book. Now, I'm not going to spend a lot of time this morning. Lord willing, I'll continue this in our Christmas Eve service. But I want to just deal with one verse of Scripture, one of those verses that we don't talk about much at Christmas. It takes us all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, and it's found in, of course, the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings. Chapter 3, a very important chapter, as you might recall, and verse 15. We're familiar that Genesis Three talks about the choices of Adam and Eve, and it also talks about the consequences of those choices and the curses, the judgment of God that came about as a result of those choices. I think about a song, and I don't even know if I know the words, but it's one of my favorites that uh, George Jones sang about choices. I've had choices since the day that I was born. and There were voices trying to teach me right from wrong, if I'd listened, I wouldn't be here today living and dying with the choices I've made. It's kind of where Adam and Eve were. They were living with their choices. And those choices caused curses. The first was a curse upon 
the serpent. And the message it reads, curse it to slink on your belly and eat dirt all of your life. And that is being fulfilled even now. Curse upon the woman because of the influence she exerted, because of the voice that she listened to and the disobedience that she exercised. The message reads, I'll multiply your pains in childbirth. You'll give birth to your babies in pain. You'll want to please your husband, but he'll lord it over you. I'll never forget watching one of those Christian TV shows. You have to be very careful about some of those. And there was a woman on there talking about how the Lord had delivered her from the curse. And because that Jesus had set her free, she knew that she would have no pain in childbirth because that was under the curse and she was not under the curse. <laughs> never heard a follow-up on that one. <laughs> I was, uh, I was with my wife when she gave birth to all three, and there was a fair amount of pain, uh, and, and almost to the point where I remember the first child, I believe it was, or maybe the second one, um, the NBA Finals were on, and there was a television there, and I was trying to comfort her and, and watch <laughs> the game, and Apparently the pain caused her to insist that the television be turned off. And so, you know, we accommodated her because I, I, apparently she's not spiritual enough to be set free from that curse and she's still experiencing it. <laughs> but women weren't the only one. There was a curse upon the ground and the man created from it. Listen to this. In the message it reads, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from. Don't eat from this tree. Very clear. The very ground is cursed because of you. Getting food from the ground will be as painful as having babies is for your wife. You'll be working in pain as long or all your life long. The ground will sprout thorns and weeds. You'll get food the hard way, and planting and tilling and harvesting, sweating in the fields from dawn to dusk until you return to that ground yourself, dead and buried. You started out as dirt, you'll end up as dirt. Thank God, because we're saved, we are not bound by that curse, and all of you, I'm sure your lawns grow free of any weeds or thorns, and uh, you don't have to work or sweat. No, of course, we still do. We still live, as one minister said, in the fallout from the fall. You say, well, pastor, what does that have to do with Christmas? Well, just like God, just like God, in the midst of these curses was a blessing, a blessing. And we forget it sometimes, but it is so important. It's found in Genesis chapter three, verse 15. And in the English Standard Version, here's how it reads. Again, following up on the curse of the serpent, God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring, not the man's, but her offspring. It reminds me of Isaiah 7, 14, and behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You get a bruised heel because you step on something. I would much rather have a bruised heel than a bruised head because that means somebody stepped on you. I love the way the message reads. God told the serpent, I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He'll wound your head, you'll wound his heel. Imagine, if you will, for a moment, Christmas cards where instead of a mother sitting on a donkey, and this just came to me as I was thinking about it, instead of a mother sitting on a donkey like you see in a lot of Christmas cards, we see the Son of God stepping on a serpent. You probably wouldn't buy that one. Instead of opening a traditional Christmas card and seeing the crash, you see Jesus crush Satan under his nail-scarred feet. Instead of a Christmas card adorned with the words, no room in the end, or in the end, you open the card that declares plenty of room in the tomb. Because Satan thought he'd won the battle, but Jesus defeated the devil's trinity of terror, death, hell, and the grave. 
Now imagine in the same way as you did that card, singing Christmas carols, but you're singing a 1719 Christmas carol. Now I, I got to tell you, I'm one of those people that loves to see these polls taken and the greatest athlete, the greatest song, the greatest movie. Have you ever noticed it's usually one that is out now or just came out in the last decade or two that is the winner? Or an athlete that's currently playing or just retired? We have historical amnesia most of the time. And so we don't think back very far. I saw this week a, a poll, the greatest Christmas song of all time, and it was one that was just written a few years ago, and I just shook my head. I thought, really? Seriously? Let's go back to 1719, to one of the greatest songwriters of all time, Isaac Watts. But this year, instead of memorizing that first verse of Joy of the World, instead of those verses, you kind of think about these verses, that third verse that goes like this. No more let sin and sorrow grow, nor thorns infest the ground. Sounds like Genesis 3. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found, far as, far as the curse is found. Curse, Pastor, we don't want to talk about that. I think we do. Because if you look at some of those seasonally incorrect Bible verses, the kind we want to hide between the front and back cover of a theology book, you'll see something you might miss. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8 in the English Standard Version reads, Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. That's who he is. That's his nature. The reason the Son of God appeared, did you hear that? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Pastor, what's the reason for the season? Jesus love. Yeah. Jesus healing. Yeah. Jesus restoration. Yes. Jesus redemption. Absolutely. But did you know also a reason for the season is to destroy the works of the devil? The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 in the English Standard Version goes on to read, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, since we are housed in these human bodies, he himself likewise partook of the same a human body, the same things. That through death he might destroy, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. Why did he take on flesh and blood like us? To destroy the power of the devil. Listen to the message. I love the way it paraphrases this verse. Since the children are made of flesh and blood, it's logical the Savior took on flesh and blood in order to rescue them by his death. That's why he came. Listen, by embracing death, taking it into himself, he destroyed the devil's hold, I love this, on death and freed all who cower through life, scared to death of death. That's our world, scared to death of death. It's that thing that Satan holds over us, but Jesus broke the power of his hold. Because he broke the power of fear. He demolished that trinity of terror, death, hell, and the grave when he arose. But he took on flesh and blood. He became one of us to do that. Those verses versus these verses. Verses that we don't need to ignore at Christmas. I was having a phone conversation with my brother yesterday. It involved a lot of different Types, recorded audio, text. But we were talking about our messages for tomorrow, and, and I sent him something that I had written for this message, and he sent me some notes also from his message. And what he texted me as I looked through it, I thought, my goodness, this could not go better with what I'm trying to communicate if, than if I had written it myself. And so I said, did you write this? He said, yeah. 
And I, I said, I'm going to use it in tomorrow's message, and I'm going to ask permission tomorrow afternoon. And <laughs> he said, okay. He said, I, won't, I probably won't even like it till Tuesday. Now, if you've ever preached, you understand that. On Monday, you cannot stand anything you've said on Sunday. It all looks like, what was I thinking? Because you, your brain, your mood, you've given everything you have, and you just kind of are not fit for human company on Monday sometimes because of that spiritual exhaustion. And so I knew what he meant when he said that, but I thought, well, I don't know how Tuesday it's going to look, but it looks good to me now because this is what I was trying to communicate. Let me just read it to you. Here's what he wrote to me. God had told Eve that Messiah was coming. The prophet Micah told us where he would be born. The angel told us where he was laid. The virgin told us that he would be holy. The shepherds told us that he was a lamb waiting to be sacrificed. The star told us where they had moved Jesus. The magi told us that he was the king to be worshipped. The sinners told us that he was the savior. The sick and afflicted told us that he was the healer. The bound and possessed told us that he was the deliverer. The soldiers told us he was obedient. Pilate told us he was from another kingdom. The cross tells us that he's already paid the price. The tomb tells us that he is irrepressibly, indomitably Lord. The throne tells us he's the king of kings. Mercy tells us that he ever lives to make intercession for the saints. Blessing tells us that He shall supply all our need. Power tells us that we can do all things. Gabriel tells us that He's the soon coming King. 1 Thessalonians tells us that the trump shall shall sound. He came to be like us, but John tells us that we are the sons of God and we shall be like Him. We didn't come to Jesus as seekers looking for a religion. We came as sinners looking for a Savior. And if it was only about a little benign baby boy born in a barn, hell wouldn't have fought so hard then and now. But while we smile at a cradle back then, hell was seeing a cross. And while we are fixated on Mary's borrowed womb, hell was dreading Joseph's borrowed tomb. As I was preparing the message, I looked over several videos this week, and I came across one that just fitted, even though it wasn't exactly the same as my message it was, because it talked about all through the Bible, in those places we don't look at Christmas, those words, those names we don't really consider for our carols or our cards. It talked about those as part of the Jesus story. I want you to watch for a few minutes as we share a video about the name Jesus. And I want you to think about Christmas in a way you don't normally think about it. Those verses that we don't normally think about as we think about the name. What name could contain such a glory? Shadows to a tapestry of color. 
disorder into calm and failure into beauty. He is a voice for the voiceless. He is dignity for the stateless soul. It is he who raised up a lowly shepherd to become a king. He who took the fishermen of Galilee and made them leaders of history. It is the counselor who redeems our lost years, breaking chains that have kept dreams imprisoned in joy confined. The name reaches across eternity, exclaimed by the splendors of galaxies, sung by the passions of angels, roared in heaven's fervor, exalted in creation's unfettered rejoicing. What name could contain you? What title? What soul now? But this is our wonderful counselor. This is our mighty God. Genesis 3, I'll put enmity between your seed and her seed. Isaiah 7, 14, behold a virgin shall conceive. Isaiah 9, 6, you'll call his name Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The New Testament talks about Emmanuel, God with us. His name shall be called Jesus, Yahashua, because he will save the people, his people from their sins. If we extract just the parts that are pretty, we take out of context the story of redemption. And we rob our children, we rob our world of the powerful story of a God who loved us so much and still loves us, of a God who came to us and still comes to us. This Christmas, I want us to act as if Christmas was part of God's plan all along in that we don't just set aside these days for special messages and special songs and we don't act like we do the rest of the year i want us to gather in the altar and i want us to sing and i want us to praise and i want us to worship and i want us to speak the name that is above every name over the sicknesses that you're facing over the troubles that you're going through i want you to cry out to god in the name of jesus and as you come, I want us to sing a song that says every one of those names that we just saw on the screen. Superimposed. Would you join me around this altar? For his name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. Master of everything, his name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. Sing this. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, and almighty God. Bow down.
before him. Love and adore him. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. Would you pray with me this morning over whatever needs you're facing? I want you to speak the name of Jesus, not as a baby in a manger, but speak him as your redeemer, your life giver, your resurrected Lord, the one who was promised in Genesis, the one who came in the gospels, the one who is coming again in Revelation. Would you call upon the Father in that name for whatever you need, whatever you're facing, or just to give him glory this morning? Would you join me in praise? Father, as we stand before you, we give praise and honor and glory. Hallelujah. 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 Because it's not just a story that is seasonal. It's not just a story that is palatable. It's one sometimes, Lord, that's hard to swallow and digest because it's not always a pretty picture because of what it cost you. Because of what sin cost us and continues to cost us. But in the name of Jesus, we thank you that from the very beginning, you made a way. When sin exposed our nakedness, you made a covering for us. And Lord, when we were still exposed in our sin, Jesus shed his blood that covers a multitude of sin. And Father, we pray in the name of Jesus, a prayer of thanksgiving this Christmas for the story. From the beginning of the book to the end of the book, Lord, we want it all. We want it all. We want to know who that Christ child was that came. We want to know why his life was threatened. How could he have mattered so much? We want to understand why we can talk about any religious leader, any world leader. But if we mention the name Jesus, we're in trouble. Because that name is still the name that is above every name. It still is a name that provokes. There's nothing neutral about it. I pray in the name of Jesus that we will understand that the reason for the season is that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. We are in a battle for our lives, our souls, but we thank you, Lord, that we can have victory through that name, Jesus, because of a resurrection. Not an empty manger, but an empty grave, an empty tomb. We thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray for Rick today, for healing for his body. I can pray that, Lord, in the name of Jesus, the Christ of Christmas, but the Christ of every day, every day. Lord, I pray for every need we mentioned, every special, significant need for Heather's family, Lord, for David's family. Situations, Lord, that calls us today to say we still need you jesus we still need a healer i agree with every person praying right now in this altar for what their need is and we speak the name of jesus 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 over the situations that we face in his name we pray in his name we pray would you just say that name with me three times jesus Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. I want you to give a gift right now. Would you reach over and place a hand maybe on the shoulder of the person standing by you? This week we've been blessed by others. And I want you to bless others right now. And I want you to be blessed right now as we give a gift of prayer and give a gift of the name of Jesus. Speak it over that friend, that brother or sister in the Lord. Father, 
we touch and agree right now. We make human contact, Lord, because that's important. We need one another. We need one another. You said don't forsake the assembling. It was more than just the fact of being together. It was the, the fact that our prayers together are powerful. Our, our, our voices raised in song are beautiful. And even though different, they make harmony. And Lord, our prayers for one another when we can't pray for ourselves, when this attack is against our mind and we can't even think straight or we're so close to the situation that we don't know what to ask for. How powerful that somebody can place their hand on us and speak the name of Jesus. And we pray in Jesus' name for one another right now, Lord. In Jesus' name. Lord, against the stress of the season, that person who feels exhausted, I place my hand on them and I pray healing in their body and restoration in Jesus' name. Lord, that parent that is feeling anything but Christmassy because of what they're going through with that child, in Jesus' name. That marriage, Lord, that is stressed out, and fractured in Jesus' name. That body that is sick, Lord, and needing a healing in Jesus' name. Lord, whatever our friends are facing, we give the gift, Lord, that you gave to us. We speak the name of Jesus. And in his name and the authority, the power of that name, we pray, Lord, for needs to be met and lives to be changed and healing to come and wholeness to be restored in Jesus' precious name. Lord, help us never to forget this started at the very beginning and you will carry us through forever, world without end. And we thank you. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name, my Lord, for He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. Let's remind ourselves. He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages, and almighty God is he. So bow down before him, love and adore him. His name is wonderful. He is Jesus, my Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. We are so glad that you were here today with us to worship. I pray that something that you heard today will go with you this week. And remember that God loves you and we do too.